A partnership of Northwest Public Media has expanded our tradition of environment coverage into a daily service. It's called Earth Fix. Every day we bring you news fixed on the environment. With a team of journalists based in Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, you get the latest news about our region's natural resources, recreation, energy, and environmental policy. Find our stories on the radio, on television, and online. Tonight, we present four stories that explore the health of a critical Northwest resource, water. Beneath the Surface, an EarthFix special. This program is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. We often think of pollution as being easy to see, but many of our region's water quality issues lie beneath the surface. Laura James has been diving in Puget Sound for more than 20 years. Just the feeling of being weightless. It's just like flying. The animals are fantastic and, and so different than anything you'll ever see up here on the surface. It's kind of like going into Wonderland. I don't think that people realize what a gem we have. It's the Emerald Sea. It's got so much life. The cold water uh, has more nutrients. It can hold more oxygen, hold more nutrients than warm water. So you get tremendous invertebrate marine life. You get octopus and wolf eels and all sorts of sea slugs, just every color of the rainbow. You go beneath the sea and it's, you're in this different world and it's mesmerizing and brilliant. One day she came across something in the water that has haunted her ever since. We were coming up the slope and I saw what looked like um, a piling and it was this big black column and, and as we got closer I realized that it was actually a storm outfall and it was so full of um, road grime and who knows what that it, it, it was just black and it was just billowing and billowing and it was it just doesn't stop. And of course went home and I started looking it up on the internet I'm like what's in storm water and I'm like we don't want that there. Stormwater is a toxic cocktail of sediment, grease, tire wear, and any litter small enough to slip into storm drains. And that's just what you can see. There's much more we can't see. Microscopic particles of heavy metals like copper and zinc are commonly found in urban highway runoff. There's also oil and petroleum-based hydrocarbons. Contrary to what a lot of people think, Runoff is Puget Sound's biggest source of pollution. Approximately 50% of the region believe that stormwater is treated, is captured and then conveyed for treatment to a treatment plant of some type, um, when in fact this doesn't take place. And almost all of this water goes off totally untreated. Throughout the United States, so much land has been paved over that the total amount of impervious surfaces would cover an area the size of Ohio. Every time water washes over these hard surfaces, pollutants pour into the nearest waterway. All these impervious surfaces means that water can't get through them. Whereas if it rains in the forest, the water hits the ground and then very slowly seeps into the soil and the soil acts like a sponge. It slows down the water, it cleans the water out, it filters it. Uh, and obviously uh, an impervious surface like pavement just doesn't do that at all. Jennifer McIntyre is leading a team that's studying how polluted runoff impacts aquatic animals. The team recently collected runoff from a highway in Seattle and trucked it down to the Washington Stormwater Center. It's one of the only facilities in the world that's conducting cutting-edge research on what's known as green stormwater infrastructure. Green stormwater infrastructure is building stormwater control structures that more closely mimic natural settings. Things like rain gardens, bioswales, green roofs. These are developing facilities or things that, that help improve water quality that are trying to mimic those natural filtration you know, aspects of water infiltrating into the ground or flowing through vegetation. Around the Northwest and across the country, new rules are being written that would require cities and counties to adopt green stormwater methods. But this prospect is causing some concern. Because green stormwater methods, such as rain gardens, are relatively new, little is known about them, or even whether they'd make any difference. 
people are, are running out there and just building rain gardens and that's great but there is the potential for them not to work because we don't know very much about them yet. So some of the things that we're hoping to learn here at this facility are what are the best soil mixtures to use, what are the best plants to use, um, how long will these systems hold up to, to a continuous input of contaminants coming from stormwater runoff. We know that they reduce some of the contaminants that are in stormwater. We know that the flows can be reduced. These are all really good things, but is that enough? Is that enough to protect wild fish and their food web from some of the harmful effects of stormwater runoff? That's what McIntyre is trying to find out. Once all the stormwater was mixed and samples were taken, the team filtered half the water through soil columns that mimic what happens in a rain garden. They then filled a series of aquariums, half with the straight highway runoff and half with runoff that had gone through rain garden filtration. And each aquarium got 10 juvenile coho salmon. And then pretty much we waited to see what would happen. Her plan was to monitor the salmon for four days. But within 12 hours, all the fish that were in the straight highway runoff were dead. And the fish in the filtered runoff, all still alive. I think it's really telling that we can take something as, as concentrated and toxic as highway runoff and pass it through soil columns and have it no longer be acutely lethal to fish. While Jennifer McIntyre searches for answers in the lab, Laura James is trying to raise awareness in the real world by documenting the effects of stormwater with her camera. If I can capture this on film, if I can share this, it will truly give our waters a voice. Because people see it and they're just, it's like shock. They stop what they're doing and they actually look. It's like a connection. I see Puget Sound and our oceans as a reflection of us. They're a reflection of our humanity. And the storm drains are like a conduit of our humanity running in there. Stormwater runoff directly affects the health of all marine life, including those that spend much of their time out of the water, like the harbor seal. This harbor seal pup is less than a year old and has come ashore in desperate need of a little rest. The average person on the beach sees a little lump. He's very well camouflaged by, you know, gravel and beach rocks and thinks it's dead. Very rarely is that pup actually dead. Usually they are just napping or resting. People often think that because they're marine mammals, that seals should be in the water at all times. But time on land is critical. Seals spend half of their life on shore. So they have as much right to be on the shore as we do. So why not make it a little bit easier for them to survive? That was Peterson's thinking when she started Seal Sitters, a group of Seattle volunteers who are ready at a moment's notice whenever a seal pup comes ashore. The need was just simply daycare on the beach, daycare for these pups, and we can do that. When someone calls the hotline, Robin Lindsay is usually the first to respond. She locates the pup and looks for any signs of injury or illness. A small brigade arrives next. They set up a perimeter to keep people at a safe distance. Then they stand back and keep watch. As long as the pup is on the beach and in a vulnerable spot, we're going to have volunteers on duty. And the pup may be here two hours, or the pup may be here 12 hours. People of all ages volunteer. 11-year-old Etienne Rushley is already a seal-sitting veteran. When you see them on the shore, they're just resting. And that's what we call hauling out. And also, if you see them stretch out their wings, that's when they thermoregulate their body temperature. They're really great. They're amazing seals. Sometimes, pups choose peculiar places to haul out. It's not just all warm and fuzzy what we do. We love watching after these harbor seal pups, but even on a greater level, it's the science behind it, and, and it's incredibly important work. The health of these year-round residents could tell us more about the health of this ecosystem. 
Harbor seals are an indicator species. They tell us the health of our sound. And we need to look to them if they are dying, if they have viruses, if they have strange mortality rates. That is directly connected to our health. This year we've had a significantly less pups, about half of the live pups as last year. And then on top of that, we've had a very high mortality of dead pups that we've responded to. And we're at a 44% mortality rate, which is twice as high as any other year we've experienced. It's a mystery to us as to why we have fewer pup visits and a higher mortality. We are very concerned. This has never happened before in our five years of documentation. Some of the biggest threats to harbor seals include toxic stormwater runoff, sewer overflows, plastic litter, and abandoned fishing equipment. In addition to a high mortality rate, seal sitters are seeing higher than average numbers of emaciated seal pups. A thick layer of blubber is critical for surviving the winter. They're excruciatingly thin, and then they return to the water and we don't see them again. It's difficult to know what will happen to the pups. But Lindsay says that the higher than average mortality rates doesn't mean that harbor seals are in danger of going extinct. We have people come up to us all the time and they'll say, well, are they endangered? And we'll go, no. And they'll go, well, so are our populations healthy? And we'll say, yes, actually the population of harbor seals are healthy. And then they'll go, so what's the point? It's amazing to have an opportunity to help any living being survive. But this little wild animal, it's a life-changing thing. Ocean acidification is altering marine ecosystems at an unprecedented rate. And an iconic Northwest resource is already feeling the impact. The oysters grown at Shina Wysocki's family farm near Olympia, Washington, are served in some of the finest restaurants in Manhattan. What's her family's secret to raising the perfect Pacific oyster? We think our water tastes great here and that makes our oysters taste great. Chelsea Farms can only raise oysters if they can purchase oyster larvae, also called oyster seed, from hatcheries. But oyster seed production in the Northwest has plummeted in recent years, by as much as 80 percent. The oceans are becoming more acidic as they absorb carbon dioxide that is added to the air from burning fossil fuels. Ocean acidification is this huge problem and there's so many things. It's the currents, it's the carbon dioxide, it's the argonite, and it's most of which I understand a tiny fraction of. But what I do understand is when the nursery calls on the phone and says there's no oyster seed to ship. They had the oyster beds all ready to go. They had spent all this time getting them there and then there's nothing to put out. It's sad. Puget Sound has some of the most corrosive water found anywhere in the world. A natural process brings acidic water from the deep ocean to the surface, where shellfish live. That's why Washington's shellfish industry, a $270 million a year business that supports 3,200 jobs, is the first to feel the effects of the global phenomenon called ocean acidification. We're an industry that relies on calcifiers, so we're the first to see the effects and scream about it. Workers at Taylor Shellfish Farms first noticed a problem in their hatcheries in Daybob Bay. With oysters, the vulnerable stage that's, that dissolves in these corrosive waters is for the first two or three days of their life. They're using a form of calcium carbonate to build their shell that dissolves really easily. When the waters were highly corrosive, the organisms died within two days. The oyster larvae just simply died. When the water was high pH, they did just fine. It was just like a switch. Richard Feely is one of the world's leading researchers on acidification. He helped hatcheries develop tactics to prevent massive oyster larvae die-offs by carefully monitoring the pH of seawater. It's been absolutely crucial. Something that simple has recovered 75% of the losses we had in larvae production just by being able to see this water and work around it. But Feely warns that this is a short-term solution. Over the next 20 or 30 years, these short-term attestation strategies won't work. 
because as we continue to release more and more CO2 in the atmosphere, and that will be taken up by the oceans, eventually the oceans will be corrosive 50% of the time or 60% of the time within the next 30 or 40 years. Feely has been tracking the changing ocean chemistry since the 1980s. And he's discovered that the oceans are already 30% more acidic than they were at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Recent models project that in the coming decades, pH will continue to drop. This would be a 100 to 150 percent increase of the acidity of the oceans by the end of the centuries. This is a very dramatic change that has not been seen in, in the world oceans for more than 50 million years. The change is happening so quickly that scientists worry marine animals won't have time to adapt. There's never been any time in the history of the planet that we know of uh, when the CO2 has increased as quickly as it is right now. Paul McElhaney leads the Ocean Acidification Lab at the NOAA Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. The animals that we're focusing on are ones that are economically and ecologically important and that we suspect might have some vulnerability to changes in the, the CO2 in the environment. He's trying to understand how the impact of acidification will ripple through the entire food web of the ocean. The difficulty is that if we're going to do anything about that, to change that trajectory, we need to do it now. By the time we wait till we actually see those, those changes in the species abundance, it will really be too late to do anything about it. That's why Washington State has made addressing ocean acidification a top priority. Governor Chris Gregoire convened a panel of scientists, policymakers, and industry officials to figure out what can be done locally to address this global problem. Among other things, they call for reducing carbon emissions, limiting local water pollution, which exacerbates the problem, and developing long-term adaptation strategies for shellfish growers. Back at Taylor Shellfish, an answer can't come soon enough. Crews work around the clock, harvesting about 50,000 oysters each night. These shellfish will end up all over the world. We are the ones that are feeling the effects of this first. We're the ones where our industries and our people and our livelihoods are being affected first. So we're leading the way. Protein from the ocean provides food for billions of people within our planet and therefore we need to understand this and appreciate the significance of this and address it. Not just for local markets like Pike Place, but also to feed the world's appetite for Puget Sound seafood. Ocean acidification threatens their business, our region's reputation for seafood, and a Northwest way of life. For decades, Northwest tribes have struggled to cope with the depletion of wild salmon populations. And now another environmental threat looms on the horizon. The coastal tribes of the Pacific Northwest call themselves salmon people. Salmon to the Swinomish tribe is like the buffalo to the tribes of the Midwest. It is, it is the food that the Creator has blessed us with. Every year they hold ceremonies to bless the fishermen and honor the returning salmon. But over the last century, the number of salmon has dropped significantly. Five populations in the Pacific Northwest are listed as endangered, including the prized Chinook salmon. Can you imagine 200 years ago what it was like to be out here? Brian Clattisby is chairman of the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community which sits at the mouth of the Skagit River. His people have fished the shores of Puget Sound since time immemorial. There was salmon in that slough 365 days out of the year. Throughout the cycle of the year, there was a different salmon that was uh, occupying those waters. Fish were still plentiful in 1855, when Clattisby's great-great-grandfather put his ex on a treaty, trading away most of their land in exchange for securing the rights for Swinomish people to continue to fish, hunt, and harvest shellfish in their historic grounds. In the 150 years since, overfishing, loss of habitat, hydroelectric dams, and competition from hatchery-raised fish have depleted wild salmon populations. 
Low returns have forced tribes to reduce their fishing to a short window. This year we got three days for the whole year to fish uh, Chinook. And now there's another threat, climate change. Rising temperatures, changing rain and snow patterns, and more hostile ocean conditions all threaten the Northwest salmon. Salmon depend on snowmelt and glacier-fed streams to survive. But since 1920, the average annual temperature in the region has risen by one and a half degrees. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, that slight rise in temperature caused the nearby South Cascade Glacier to shrink to half what it was a century ago. Hydrologist and University of Washington professor Alan Hamlet says the loss of snowpack in glaciers has many consequences. When we lose the snowpack in the mountains and the glaciers, those are a kind of water tower, a way of storing water under natural conditions. And when we lose that water tower, then the flows in the summer go down. This means higher flows in the winter and lower flows in the summer, a combination that impacts salmon at every stage of their life cycle. Increased winter flooding can wash away salmon eggs and small young fish. And in the summer, water temperatures can rise above 70 degrees, creating conditions that are lethal to cold water fish. Hamlet and other researchers project that by 2080, nearly half of the streams they monitor will regularly reach peak summer temperatures of higher than 70. All of these fish are very vulnerable to climate change, particularly from water temperature, but also from changes in flow and in the marine environment. Estuaries act as nurseries for juvenile salmon, a place where they can find food and protection before heading out into the ocean. As sea levels rise, some of these habitats may be lost. We're expecting to see substantial sea level rise, perhaps a meter of sea level rise, um, and uh, that will inundate this area if nothing else changes. After watching other tribal communities lose their homelands and traditional food sources, Cladisby fears that his tribe will be next. I, I don't know, you know, why climate change is happening. I don't know if it's just, if it's just a cycle in the earth, you know, it's a generational thing, or if there's too much pollution uh, entering the atmosphere. And so when we are seeing, you know, climate change impacts in our areas, we figured we better get ahead of the curve. To get ahead of the curve, they became the first tribe in the country to conduct a comprehensive climate adaptation assessment. It melds their direct observations of the natural world with top scientific research. Billy Frank Jr. is chairman of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. He says native people recognize when the climate is out of sync. We know all about the ocean. We know the currents and we know everything that's going on out here. We learn from the animals. We learn from the birds. We learn from our surroundings. You know, we learn from each other. Ray Harris agrees. He's a fisherman with the Shemanis First Nation on Vancouver Island. Traditional knowledge is, uh, is, is like on the ground stuff. It's not a theory. From observing and testing and catching and eating, we know how the state of the resource is. It's not that we take a piece of it and send it back east to get tested in some test tube. We put it on a table and we feed our people. Researchers with the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group and the Skagit Climate Science Consortium have created models that show how Swinomish homelands will look in the future. They estimate that 15% of the reservation is at risk from rising seas, including key environmental areas such as the tribe's shellfish beds. Biologist Larry Wasserman has worked with tribes for decades. He hopes this research will help local policymakers prepare. And really the issue that I believe will affect the tribe's natural resources and other folks' responses to climate is their ability to understand climate change in their backyard. And much of the science work that's being done is being done at a regional scale or a global scale. And so it doesn't become usable to local communities. That's where it needs to start. While studies show that native people face a greater risk from shifts in climate, Hamlet thinks they are also uniquely qualified to cope. The interesting thing is that the tribes are maybe better positioned 
um, to take that long sustainability viewpoint. We often you know, hear about the tribes planning for seven generations ahead. That's about the right time scale for sea level rise planning. Tribes may not be able to prevent the seas from rising or the climate from changing, but they may be well positioned to lead the way when it comes to protecting salmon. And Cladisby believes the young people in his community are ready to take on that long-term challenge. You know, we are slowly starting to get back one generation at a time that knowledge of treating the environment as a brother or as a sister, and that all living and non-living things uh, live together here on this earth. And when you impact one, you impact the other. So we're slowly starting to see uh, the younger generation become aware of, uh, you know, Mother Nature, become aware of the environment, and making sure that it is up to us to make sure that we do not continue the practices that occurred in the last hundred years. Billy Frank says there's not really a choice. You know, change, make it happen, do something, you know, and let's do it. We, we're running out of time, you know, and so we got to make a change. A change for themselves and a change for the next seven generations.